In this chapter, we will look at the sources of magnetic field. First, we will consider a conductor, a straight conductor carrying current. We will find a formula for the magnetic field due to that current. Second, we will look at a solenoid. Third, a toroid. And finally, we will find the magnetic field due to a circular coil. Now, in order to find the magnetic field due to these four geometric shapes, we will use two laws. The first one is Ampere's law, which we will apply in three cases. And then we will use what's known as Biot and Savart's law for the last case of a circular coil. So let's jump in straight into the chapter. Basically, Ampere's law is used to find the magnetic field, right? So in this law, as you can see in this diagram, first of all, we consider a straight conductor. So that's a straight conductor carrying current upwards. And next, we imagine a closed path around the conductor. It can be of any shape. It need not be circular, so it needs to be a closed path. And this path is imagined to be divided into small sections, as you can see, tiny sections. And we are considering one set section of length dl. And at that point, we're considering the magnetic field to be B. So we consider a section, a small section of length DL where the magnetic field is B. And we take the dot product of B and DL, the dot product of B and DL, and integrate that over the entire closed path. So that's what we do on the left-hand side. And according to Ampere's law, when we do that, we will get mu naught times the current enclosed by that path. Now, the current enclosed by this path is I. So on the right side, we will get mu naught times I, where mu naught is the permeability of free space. On the left-hand side, we will have closed line integral B dot DL. So that is Ampere's law. So the current is I, closed, so that shows closed line integral B dot DL is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. So I should be the current inside the path that we have picked. So that, that's Ampere's law. We're gonna apply this law in three of the cases. So it's important that you understand this. So we first consider an imaginary path and you take the line integral of B dot DL over the entire path, that should be equal to mu naught multiplied by the current inside that path. It's important to remember that we only consider the current inside that path. So if there is a current outside that path, it's going to be equal to zero. All right, let me apply this first in the case of a straight conductor. So here it is. This is the straight conductor carrying current I amperes. And the path that I have considered in this case is a perfect circle with the center on the conductor. And according to the right-hand rule, if you hold the thumb in the direction of the current, which is in this case flowing up, as you can see that the current is flowing up. So hold the right hand with the thumb pointing in the direction of the current, then the closed fingers to the tips will give you the direction of the magnetic field. So if the current is flowing up, as in this case, the magnetic field is this way. So that's why on the right side, the magnetic field will be into the screen, while on the left side, the magnetic field will be out of the screen. 
All right, is that clear enough? The current is flowing up and the fingers are going this way. So here, the magnetic field is into the screen and on this side, the magnetic field is out of the screen. Okay? And then we're going to apply Ampere's law. Let the radius of that path be little r and according to Ampere's law, we got to take the Integral on the left hand side, B is going to be a constant at every point because B is at the same, I mean, the, this is at the same distance from the center, so the magnetic field all around at those points must be the same. So B is a constant, so that's why it's taken out. And then what you have is integral DL. Integral DL is simply the circumference of the circle. And the circumference is 2 pi times R. So you have b times, or b dot 2 pi r is mu naught times i. Rearrange that and you get b is mu naught i by 2 pi r. This gives the formula for the magnitude of magnetic field due to any straight conductor at a point r distance away. Now the direction is given by the right hand rule and the magnitude is given by this formula. So here is a simple example. Let's consider that the current is 2 ampere. We're trying to calculate the magnetic field at a point 10 centimeters away from the conductor. 10 centimeters is 0 0.1 meter. And so when you plug it into that formula, Remember, mu naught is the permeability of free space, which is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. So multiplied by the current, divided by 2 pi times 0 0.1, which will give the magnetic field to be 4 times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla. So that's how we calculate the magnetic field at any point away from a straight conductor. Now, in order for this formula to be applied, the conductor needs to be infinitely long. Now, do you have a conductor that's infinitely long? No. So what it means is that if this is the conductor and it's only, let's say, half a meter, and if you're trying to find the magnetic field at a point very close to the conductor, since r is small, much smaller than the length, you can imagine this is an infinitely long conductor. So what it means is that if it's a small conductor and you try to find the magnetic field really far away, now you see the r becomes comparable to the length of the conductor, then you can't use this formula. So in short, to apply this formula, the distance of the point must be significantly smaller than the length of the conductor. This is the first conductor carrying current 2 amperes and the second one is carrying a current of 3 amperes and assume that they are separated by 20 centimeters. And we are trying to find, we're trying to find the, the magnetic field at a point P. We will find the force later on, but first let's, let's actually find the magnetic field due to both of these currents at a point P. All right, so first use the right-hand rule. When you use the right-hand rule, at the point P, what's the direction of the magnetic field due to two amperes? Any idea? Okay, the fingers curve this way. And we're looking at point P, which is on the right side. So that means the magnetic field must be into the screen. So you see that? It goes into the screen because the current is up. Now, when you come to the second conductor, the, this is the second conductor and the current is up and point P is to the left side. It's here. So the magnetic field is going to be out of the plane of the screen. You see how that works? For the first conductor, the magnetic field here is into, while for the second conductor, since the point P is on the left side, the magnetic field is going to be out. So the magnetic fields are in opposite directions. So now what all we need to do is 
find those two magnetic fields and find the difference. So we know, so I'm showing the directions there, and as you can see here, the directions are opposite to each other, as I explained. And uh, now we gotta find the magnetic fields due to both, individually. I'll call them, so B is mu naught I by two pi times R. So for the first one, mu naught, remember mu naught is four pi times 10 to the negative seven. The current for the first one is two ampere divided by two pi times r. Now r is 10 centimeters because it's right in the middle, okay? 10 centimeters is 0.1 meter, and so you get, we did this before, four times 10 to the negative six Tesla. Likewise, we will find the magnetic field B2 due to the second conductor, same distance away, only the current is different. Now it's three, instead of being two amperes, the current is three, so we get six times 10 to the negative six Tesla. Therefore, the net magnetic field at P is going to be the difference between them because they are in opposite directions. And that gives six minus four, which is two times 10 to the negative six Tesla and it's going to be, the net field is going to be out of the screen because six was out of the uh, screen. So that being bigger, the net magnetic field is out of the screen, okay? But if one of these currents were in opposite direction, like if three amperes was flowing down instead of flowing up, then you will see that by the right-hand rule, look at that, you have to hold your thumb down now and now you see that at a point P, which is on the left side, the magnetic field is again into the screen. So since the magnetic fields are both now into the screen, you would take the sum and that you would give you six plus four, 10 times 10 to the negative six Tesla. All right, next we are going to consider two straight parallel conductors kept close to each other and both of them are carrying currents in the same direction. So now what's gonna happen is, the current through the first conductor sets up a magnetic field all around it, right? And now you're keeping that second conductor in the magnetic field produced by the first one. And from the last chapter we know that whenever a current carrying conductor is kept in a magnetic field, a force acts on it. So there's gonna be a force on the second conductor because it's carrying a current and it's situated in the magnetic field produced by the current through the first one. Likewise, there's also gonna be a force on the first conductor. Why? Because it is carrying a current and it's situated in the magnetic field produced by the current due to the second one. So whenever you have two parallel conductors ca carrying currents in the same direction, I'm gonna show that there is an attractive force between them. If the currents are opposite, then there will be a repulsive force between them. So let's first look at the directions and then try to find out a formula for the force acting. So here we go. Now let us try to find the force between these two parallel conductors. The same two conductors. And uh, here we're considering the first one to carry a current two amperes. So at a distance uh, 10 centimeters away, we already calculated the magnetic field to be four times 10 to the negative six Tesla. And we will situate the second conductor exactly at that point right there, and assume it's carrying three amperes, okay? So now, the conductor carrying a current three amperes is placed in a magnetic field of four times 10 to the negative six Tesla. Therefore, a force acts on it, and the force is given by B I L sine theta, where theta is the angle between the conductor there is a conductor or the current and the magnetic field, which is 90 in this case, because the magnetic field is 
you know, either in or out, and the current is up. So it's 90, sine 90 is one, so the formula now becomes bi times L. B is four times 10 to the negative six. I is three ampere. Remember, that's the current through the second one. And we are assuming that the length of the each conductor is one meter. Just assume that the length of each conductor is one meter to make matters easy. And so you get the force as 12 times 10 to the negative six newtons. That is the force acting on the second conductor carrying current three amperes. Because it is situated in a magnetic field produced by the current due to the first one. Okay. So now let's find out, you know, let's find out the magnetic field. Let's actually find out the formula for a force. You know, it's easy because this is what we did. B is mu naught I1 by 2 pi R. I'm going to call it B1. And force is that magnetic field times I2 times length, right? So in place of B, I'm going to substitute this whole thing, which gives you mu naught I1 by 2 pi R I2 times the length. And therefore, when you substitute the value of mu naught, and um, you know that the two pi down, the pi's can get canceled. Four by two is two. So you get two times 10 to the negative seven newtons. Assuming that both the currents are one ampere. So if I1 is equal to one ampere, I2 is equal to one ampere, the length of each conductor is one meter and the distance between them is also one meter, then you get two times 10 to the negative seven Newton. Okay, so that means we can now define an ampere. We can define an ampere as that current, which when flowing through two straight parallel conductors, kept one meter apart, produces a force of two times 10 to the negative seven Newton. Let me state that again. One ampere is defined as that current, which when flowing through, Two straight parallel conductors kept one meter apart in vacuum or free space produces a force of two times 10 to the negative seven Newton. Next, let us apply Ampere's law to find the magnetic field due to a solenoid. Now, what is a solenoid? A solenoid is an extended coil. So if we have a cylindrical tube, and then you have a coil wound over it with the turns really close to each other, you know, you get a long extended coil that's called a solenoid. So when you send a current through the solenoid, you see, look at this, the current will go through each turn up and then return and then go to the second turn and then return and then go through the third turn. So when you look at it, you see that the currents are all going into the screen on the top. So because the currents are going into the screen on the top, you see that? While at the bottom, the currents are all coming out. Well, it depends on how the coil is wound over it, okay? So here is the diagram that really explains the crosses here, you know, the cross shows the back of an arrow. That means the currents are going into the page at these points, while at the bottom you have dots, which shows the tip of the arrow. That means the currents are coming out. And we're trying to find the magnetic field inside the solenoid. Technically, there would only be a very weak magnetic field outside the solenoid, you know, which is negligible. And so we're trying to find the magnetic field inside the solenoid. Now, in order to do that, we're going to apply Ampere's law. And what's the first step in Ampere's law? You have to consider an imaginary path, which is closed. So the yellow rectangle here shows the imaginary path, which is closed. 
Now, the part of this rectangle is inside the solenoid, while there is one part outside and you have the sides here. If you apply the right hand rule, you see that now you can hold these fingers in the direction of the current because they are interchangeable. You know, you should hold the fingers in the direction of the current. Remember, on top the current is going in and bottom it's coming out. So, and then the thumb will give you the direction of the magnetic field. That is why the magnetic field is all shown from right to left because of the right hand rule. So when you look at the segment inside here, you're going to have to take integral b dot dl. Remember that a dot product involves cosine of theta because a dot b is a b cosine theta. So here, this is the direction of the current, or this is the direction in which we are moving. Well, not the direction of current, we're moving. So that is DL, and that's the same as the magnetic field. So both are in the same direction, DL and B. That means theta is zero, and cosine zero is one. So here, when you take the dot product, you are simply going to get B times the total length. Right? Now, when you get to this part, DL is now up and B is this way, so the angle is 90. See, DL, we're going up, B is this way, theta 90, cosine 90 is zero. Same thing on this side. That means there is no contribution to the magnetic field on these two sides because theta is 90. Now, the finally, the part three is completely outside the solenoid. And like I mentioned, the magnetic field outside the solenoid is negligible. So on that account, there is no contribution from three either. So there is no contribution from two, three, and four. And the only contribution to the magnetic field is from one, which is B times the length, because theta is zero. So... Here is, by, uh, here is Ampere's law. Integral B dot DL is equal to mu naught I. And then I should be the I enclosed. The only contribution is B times the length. Remember, that's taken as the length. And so on the... Oh, and on the right side, in this particular length, let us say that in this particular length, there are n turns, caps n turns, and each turn is carrying a current i, correct? Therefore, the total current is n times i, because there are n turns, and each turn is carrying a current i. The total enclosed current in that path is n times i. So, when you rearrange, you get mu naught n i by the length, but n by the length, so you're dividing the total number of turns by the total length. That's going to give you the number of turns in one meter, which I'm going to represent as little n. So mu naught n i, where little n is total number of turns divided by the total length. And that gives us the formula for magnetic field due to a solenoid on the inside of the solenoid. I hope that makes sense. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now here is an example if n is 300 so we're assuming there are 300 turns in 30 centimeters we've got to change the centimeters into meter and if the current is 2 amperes what's the magnetic field simple enough the formula is mu naught n i by the length length has got to be in meters Mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. All right, so 300 times, all right, 2 divided by 0.3 because it's in meters, and that comes out to be 25.136 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. So that's how we calculate the magnetic field on the axis of a solenoid applying Ampere's law.
Next, let us apply Ampere's law to find the magnetic field due to a toroid. A toroid is shown here. It's actually a solenoid, uh, which is wound on something on a flexible core, and so you can bend it back and make a circle. So that's a toroid. So it's, it's just like a solenoid. Instead of being straight, it's bent in the form of a circle. So that's, that's a toroid. Now, B represents a loosely wound toroid where the turns are not close to each other. So there is no symmetry in this case, and the formula that we're going to derive does not apply to that case. But when you look at C, you see that the turns are very close to each other, so that's a tightly wound toroid, and there is perfect symmetry there, and so we can apply Ampere's law into that, into that case. Again, remember, the crosses show the currents going in and the dots show the currents coming out because the currents are going in through the top and then coming out through the bottom as before. And first, we will try to find the magnetic field at a point outside the toroid. Actually, you may think this is inside the toroid. No, it's outside. It's outside the toroid because the toroid itself is here. So any point that's here or there are both outside. So what I'm trying to say, this is a point outside while this is also a point outside. The only point inside the toroid is this one. So when you look at the points outside the toroid and you take that imaginary path, how much current do you have inside that path? Is there any current inside this path? Nothing. Therefore, what's the magnetic field? The right-hand side becomes zero because the current enclosed is zero. Zero multiplied by mu naught is zero. So there's right-hand side is zero. That means the left-hand side must be zero. So B is zero. In short, there is no magnetic field here. Now, what about a point on the very outside, like here? Okay, so you have an imaginary path here, which is called D3. Are there currents inside this? Yes, there are. But the total current is going to be zero. Do you know why? Because the current here is going in and the current here is coming out. So in every turn, whatever current is going in is coming out. So they cancel out. So cancellation happens in all the turns and therefore, the total current is zero. That's why there is no magnetic field here at any point outside the solid, uh, outside the toroid, I mean. So now the only point that remains is the point that's really inside. So we're talking about D2 now, which is the imaginary path. And we will consider that that path has a radius and then we'll do the integration over that radius. So let me show you how that's done. So we're talking about a point inside the toroid. And this is Ampere's law. <clears throat> Excuse me. Integral B dot DL is mu naught I enclosed. And uh, B is going to be a constant because, you know, all these points, oh, all, all these points are at equal distance so B is going to be the same at every point, so that can be taken out. And then you have integral DL, which is going to be the circumference there. So it's 2 pi R. All right. Remember where R is the radius of that path. And then as before, the total enclosed current is N times I, where N is the total number of turns in the toroid. So when you rearrange that, you get mu naught Ni, by 2 pi r as the magnetic field. So as r changes, the magnetic field is going to change. r can only change from the inner radius to the outer radius. Anything beyond that is zero. Anything below this is zero. Okay? So we applied Ampere's law to three cases. Now we're going to have to do Biot and Sawat's law. I'll explain that first, and then we're going to apply that to a circular coil to find the magnetic field.
So that will be the last part of this chapter. So biot in Savart's law is applied to an elemental conductor. That means a very small conductor. So we could imagine that there is a big conductor, but got to imagine that it's chopped into tiny conductors. And we will take the length of one section to be dl. And we will try to find the magnetic field due to the current flowing through that section. So here it is. So this is the conductor through which the current is flowing. And we're considering a tiny section of that conductor of length dl. We're trying to find the magnetic field at this point, which is our distance away. And by the right-hand rule, we already know that if you hold the thumb, in the direction of the current, then at this point, which is on this side, the magnetic field is going to be into, you see that, into the plane of the screen. But if it was a point on this side, then the magnetic field is going to be out. See how that works? So that's the direction of the current. Current is flowing there. And then you have the magnetic field into the screen. That's why there is a cross shown there. A cross always shows something perpendicular into. And a dot represents a vector that's again perpendicular but out of it. Okay? So that's the direction. And that, that magnetic field should actually be perpendicular to the plane containing the conductor and the point. All right, let me slow down. It should be perpendicular to the plane containing the conductor and the point. So if that's the conductor and this is the point, that's the plane. See that? In this case, the plane containing the conductor and the point is of course the plane of the screen. That's why I said it's perpendicular to the screen. I hope that makes more sense. So that's the direction. And then one more thing we need is to look at an angle here. See, that's the angle between DL and R. Like, if I had taken the point here, then you know that the angle would have been smaller. See that? So if I move the point even closer, the angle becomes smaller. So it's not just the distance of the point that's changing, the angle also changes. So there are four factors that affect the magnetic field here. Number one, the strength of the current, right? The stronger the current, the bigger the magnetic field. Number two, the distance. Well, we know as the distance increases, the magnetic field is going to decrease. Common sense. That's factor number two. Factor number three, it's going to depend on the length of the conductor. Bigger the length, bigger the magnetic field. Number four, the angle. So in Biot and Sawat's law, we have a formula that gives the small magnetic field here as a function of all of these four factors. Here it's coming up. It's mu naught by 4 pi, I dl cross r. Oh, that's a cross product now. dl cross r divided by r squared. Now, one minute, just Understand that this R is just a unit vector, like IJK, which has a value 1. And it's written there just to show that it's a cross product. So please don't cancel R and R squared. Please don't do that because R is just a unit vector. Okay? And a cross product always involves what? Sine theta, right? So when you rewrite this, it can be written as mu naught by 4 pi, I dl sine theta by r squared. Now don't ask me what happened to that r because I already explained that that's just a unit vector. So, well, I've shown the direction of the magnetic field again into the screen. All right. And also understand that if theta is 90, theta is 90, then the magnetic field becomes maximum because sine 90 is 1. So that is Biot and Sawat's law. And now we're going to try to apply Biot and Sawat's law to find the magnetic field due to a semicircular conductor carrying a current I. 
and the radius of that semicircle is caps R, and we're trying to find the magnetic field here due to this conductor carrying current. So we're considering a small section DL here, and you see that the angle here would be D theta, while this total angle between the ends is theta. So that's going to be D theta, this is theta. Uh, when I apply it, you will quickly understand. So first let's write Biot and Savart's law. Here it is. Mu naught by 4 pi integral I DL cross R by R squared. Why integral? Because, you know, due to each small section, we have dB is equal to something. So when you integrate on the left side, integral dB is B. And so you got to integrate on the right side to find the total magnetic field due to all of those little sections here. That's why we are integrating. Okay, so mu naught by 4 pi. And in this case, remember that the angle between dl and r is, of course, 90 degrees at every point. Because when you reach here, r is going to be this way. Once again, a dl is tangential and the angle between radius and tangent is 90 degrees. So theta is 90, remember that. Okay, but we can substitute dl cross r as r d theta. I'm going to show you. dl cross r is r d theta. Because dl is perpendicular to r, like I told you, that means dl cross r, which is defined as sine theta, sine 90, now just makes it dl. Don't ask me what happened to r. Remember, r is a unit vector. So that's just dl. And also we know the length of an arc is radius times the angle. So dl is r d theta. dl. So when I substitute for dl, I get R D theta. So DL cross R became DL and DL is R D theta. So that makes sense, correct? And then next you can cancel these and integrate. So the R being a constant is taken out because the distance is the same to every point. Distance is the same. That's taken out. And then integral D theta is what you have there, right? So mu naught I by 4 pi R Integral d theta, in this case, is theta. So that's the total angle. So whenever you apply this to do problems, remember theta has got to be in radians, not in degrees. So this is the first application of Biot and Savart's law to a semicircular current. Cut. All right, the last application of Biot and Savart's law is in the case of a circular coil. So there's going to be some 3D here. So try to follow along carefully. So that's a circular coil. Current is coming in. It's just a loop. I shouldn't say coil. It's just one turn, you know. So it's a loop. So current is coming in and then going through that loop and flowing out. And we're trying to find the magnetic field at this point. And this point is on the axis of the coil or the loop. See, that's the axis. So that point is there. So what we will do is, we will imagine that this loop is divided into tiny sections, each of length dl, and we're going to consider this section dl here, and we know that the magnetic field due to the current in that section at this point must be perpendicular to the plane containing the two. This is the plane. I know this is a line, but that represents a line in that plane. So the magnetic field would be perpendicular to the plane and out because of the right-hand rule. Okay? Similarly, if you take a diametrically opposite section, which is this one, straight opposite to this, the magnetic field at the same point would be perpendicular to this plane, which is given by this. See that? And 
each magnetic field can be divided into or resolved into its components, one horizontal and the other vertical. Do the same with this. As I'm going to show you, you have the horizontal and the vertical. And if you were watching carefully, you would see that the vertical components are equal and opposite. So they cancel out while the horizontal components add up. So when we take each and every tiny section here, there is going to be a diametrically opposite section. And so all the vertical components cancel out. So we would get a total magnetic field along the axis of the coil, which I'm going to find out, okay? So all we got to do is find integral dB sine theta. So now you're saying, where did that come from? Okay, if that's dB and this is theta, all right, so you're going to get this component as dB cosine theta. But I've not drawn that. I'll draw it at the end. This angle is taken as theta. So this would be dB cosine. This will be dB sine. So the dB cosines cancel out. And then we take the integral of dB sine theta. And what is dB? dB is mu naught by 4 pi I dl by I dl sine theta by R squared. So now integrate this whole thing and all of the constants are taken out. The only variable is the length, which is integral dl. And when you take integral dl over the whole circle, of course you get the circumference of that, which is written as 2 pi r. So caps r is the radius of the loop. Another change here is sine theta is r by r. So this is r, correct? And this is little r. So you see that? This is the caps radius. This is the little radius. And the sine theta, this is the theta there. This is the theta that is shown. And so opposite side divided by hypotenuse, if this is the angle. I'm going to label theta there, okay? So that's why you have sine theta is r by r. Anyway, follow along, so you have that. Um, you know that r squared times r is r cubed, and then we're going to represent, we're going to take this as x. So you have a right angle triangle here, and you have this as caps r, this is small r, and this is x, and you know the relation between them is r squared is r squared plus x squared. So r is r squared plus x squared raised to half, which is square root. So r cubed would be r squared plus x squared raised to 3 by 2. All right, so I'm going to substitute that for r squared here. I mean r cubed down, so that will be mu naught i r squared by 2 r squared plus x squared 3 by 2. That's the magnetic field at a point x distance away. What if we wanted to find the magnetic field right at the center of the loop? Then just put x is equal to 0. So in this equation, x becomes 0. So you will have r squared raised to 3 by 2, which is r cubed. And then on top you have r squared, a cancellation happens and then you will be left with a caps R in the denominator. I know you got to follow along really carefully. Okay, and so at the center of the loop, you get the magnetic field to be mu naught I by 2R. Let me also tell you that if there are N turns, then it becomes a coil and you can... So let us work out some problems now. Here is the first question. Two long, thin parallel wires, 13 centimeters apart, carry 35 ampere currents in the same direction. Determine the magnetic field vector at a point 10 centimeters from one and 6 centimeters from the other. Alright, so here you have the first conductor and here of the second one. These cables are actually perpendicular to the plane of the screen. And 
let's assume that both the currents are coming out of the screen. Both the currents coming out, that's why I've shown points here, because both the currents are in the same direction. So the cables are kept, oh, I'm sorry, it's so tough to show it. The cables are kept like that, I hope you can see, and the currents are coming out, and we are trying to find the magnetic field here, which is six centimeters from that, and how much is that? 10 centimeters from the other, and this is given as 13. The major problem in this question is that we need these angles. So this angle, we will call it theta one, and this angle, we will call it theta two. We can find these two angles using the cosine law. So look up what the cosine law is. I'm gonna use it here. According to the cosine law, the cosine of the angle here is the squares, the sum of the squares of these two minus two times the product of these two. Okay, as you are going to see, we need, anyways, this is angle theta one, this is theta two, we got to find the two angles. You know why? Because this current produces a magnetic field here, which is perpendicular to both of those points, which means it will be perpendicular to this. And again, this will produce a magnetic field here, which will be perpendicular to this. And then we got to resolve those two into their components and find the net magnetic field. Here we go. So those are the two magnetic fields produced. Let me go back. This is the magnetic field due to this current. You can see it's perpendicular to that line or plane. This is the magnetic field produced by this current and it is perpendicular to this plane. So next we will resolve this into its horizontal component and vertical component. Do the same with this. It will have a horizontal component and a vertical component. Did you notice that both the vertical components are in the same direction while the horizontal are in opposite? Okay. So those are the components there. As you can see, I call it B1 and B2. And these angles, theta 1 will be the same as this angle and this theta 2 will be the same as this angle from the geometry of the diagram. So... This was, uh, I'm calling it B1X and B1Y, B2X and B2Y. So B1 is mu naught I by 2 pi R because essentially both of these are straight conductors. So we use the formula for magnetic field. Due to a straight conductor, the current is 35 ampere. Distance is in meters, so that's why it's 0.06. You get that first magnetic field due to this current. Same thing, find the magnetic field due to the second current. Remember the distance now is 10 centimeter, which is 0.1 meter. The current is the same. So you do that math and then you get the magnetic field due to the second conductor. Next, we have to find the components, but before that, remember we have to find the angle using the law of cosines. Here is the law of cosines. Theta one is cosine inverse of the sum of the squares of these two minus the square of the opposite side, okay? Look that up, slow it down. Uh, find the angle theta one. Similarly, find the angle theta two so here you take the sum of the squares of these two minus the square of this side, okay? Once you get the angles, you got to find the cosine and the sine. Yes, yes, this has multiple parts, okay? But we got this in UP1, so we need to be able to apply it here. So why are we taking the difference? Because... Remember the horizontal components are opposite. So that's why I'm taking the difference for the X components. And then when it comes to the Y components, you just add them because both are in the same direction. Okay? 
So slow down and look at the math at your own pace, uh, but I need to keep on going so that the video doesn't become like three hours long, okay? I hope you understand that. So add those two, you get the total Y component, and then once you get the total X and the total Y, of course you know that if you take the sum of the squares, take the square root, you will get the net magnetic field. All right, so that's what I'm gonna do. So I got the net X and the net Y, and now find the total magnetic field or the net magnetic field. And you can also find the angle at which that X taking tan inverse of BY by BX. And you get it as 82.2 degrees. Cut. So in this question, a long horizontal wire carries 24 amperes of current due north. What is the net magnetic field 20 centimeters due west of the wire if the Earth's field there points downward 44 degrees below the horizontal and has a magnitude 4 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. So first of all, we need to have a, 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 a wire that is horizontal. So let's say that's the, the wire that's horizontal. So let's say that's north. So the, the current is flowing to the north. And west would be here. We're trying to find the magnetic field 20 centimeters to the west, so here. At this point, you know the magnetic field should be perpendicular to the plane containing the two. Perpendicular to the plane containing the two. So that would be this plane. And when you use the right-hand rule, you would see that the magnetic field there is going to be up. So that's the magnetic field due to this current here is going to be straight up, vertically up. And at the same point, there is the Earth's magnetic field, which is making an angle of 44 degrees. You see, 44 degrees below the horizontal. So below the horizontal, 44 degrees. So there are two magnetic fields at that point. One magnetic field is straight up, and the other is at 44 degrees below the horizontal. All right, let's see that. Those are the magnetic fields. You see the magnetic field due to that current in the conductor? And then this is the Earth's magnetic field. Now the Earth's magnetic field needs to be resolved into the vertical and the horizontal component. Remember this angle is given us 44. So this would be cosine 44 multiplied by the Earth's magnetic field. This would be sine 44 times the Earth's magnetic field. And then you take the, the difference between these two vectors. You would get the total Y, and then this is the X, so we can find the net magnetic field. So that is the idea. Let's go. So the magnetic field due to this wire is, you know, given by the formula mu naught i by 2 pi r, which I'm going to find. Okay, so that's mu naught i by 2 pi r. Mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. The current is 24 amperes. 2 pi times 20 centimeters is 0.2 meters. So you get it as 2.4 times 10 to the negative 5 tesla. And that is the Earth's magnetic field. So the Earth's magnetic field has a X component, which is BE cosine 44, which I'm finding. And then it has a Y component, which is BE sine. But here I've taken the net Y, you know, because I've just taken the difference between this and this, as you can see. So I have the two components the X and the Y, and then I'm finding the net. Square both, add them, take the square root. You would get the net magnetic field at that point. And that comes out to be 3.8 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. 
And the angle at which that's going to act is again tan inverse by by bx. When you have that right angle triangle, you know, uh, you see you have the x and the y and tan inverse is going to be the opposite by the adjacent. So that's how I get it as 17 degrees below the horizontal. That's the direction of the net. In this question, there are two straight parallel wires separated by six centimeters. Two straight parallel wires. There is a two ampere current flowing in the first one. If the magnetic field strength is found to be zero between the two, at a distance of 2.2 centimeters from the first one, what is the magnitude and direction of the current in the second one? So one thing is very clear, you have these two conductors and it says that the magnetic field between them is zero. What does that mean? That means the magnetic field due to each current is in the opposite direction. That's why they cancelled out and became zero. Okay? So here is the diagram, those are the two conductors, the straight parallel wires and you know that this shows that the currents are both coming out of the screen. So the conductors are kept like that, the currents are coming uh, towards me, like out of the screen. And then they are separated by six centimeters. Okay, this point is uh, two centimeters away from one, which means it's 3.8 centimeters from the other one. And the magnetic fields are going to be opposite by using the right hand rule. You should be able to figure that out by now. So I've called them one and two. The conductors are one and two and the magnetic field is, are in opposite directions, okay? I call them B1, B2. And uh, you know that due to a straight conductor, B is mu naught I1 by two pi. See, I have forgotten to written two pi doesn't make any difference, you know, because in my mind, the 2 pi cancelled out. Remember that when I put 2 pi here and 2 pi here and take it to the other side, the 2 pi's will cancel out. So will the mu naughts. That's why I have not written it. Technically, I should have. So in the end, you get I1 by R1 is equal to I2 by R2. And such an easy one. So just rearrange, find I2. I1 is 2, R2 by R1. This could be in centimeters because it's a ratio. So I just left it in centimeters and the answer is 3.5 ampere. So in this question, a compass needle points 28 degrees east of north outdoors. So 28 degrees north of east. So that would be, if that's the north, it's 28 degrees north of east. I mean east of north. However, when it's placed 12 centimeters to the east of a vertical wire inside a building, it points 55 degrees east of north. So initially the compass needle was only being acted upon by the Earth's magnetic field, but now when it is kept near 12 centimeters to the east of a vertical wire. It's also acted upon by the magnetic field due to that current in that wire. Therefore, the compass needle deflects. And we have to find the magnitude and direction of the current in the wire. The Earth's field is given. So here is the diagram. So that's where it's kept. 12 centimeters away from a vertical wire. Initially, it was uh, showing this direction. It was showing uh, 28 degrees east of north. Remember, that's the north. So it's, it turned about 28 degrees to the east. And then we know that the magnetic field due to the uh, current in this wire is perpendicular to the plane containing the two points and down. So as a result of these two fields, now the compass needle turns from here 
a little bit more and is now oriented along that direction. All right, so the compass needle turns and there is the new direction at which it is. So this is the Earth's magnetic field. This is the magnetic field due to the conductor, which is the same thing. And this is the resultant, okay? The Earth's magnetic field, the magnetic field due to the uh, current in the conductor and the net magnetic field. So that's the idea there. Okay. So now we get this as 27 because the total is 55 and 28 plus 27 gives 55. So that's why this is 27. So you have a, right, uh, you have a triangle here where this angle is 27. We know this angle is 28 and we have to use the law of sines in this case. Law of sines. Earlier we used the law of cosines. Now we're using the law of sines where if you take one side of oh, one side of a triangle and take the ratio of the sine of the opposite angle, it should be the same as the other side with the ratio of this angle, okay? And that, that angle is 125 degrees because the total angle is uh, 180 in a triangle, so this should be 125. So that's a sine law or the law of sines. And when you rearrange that, you can find the magnetic field due to the uh, wire by simply substituting the value of magnetic field due to a straight conductor. That's the formula. We can rearrange that and calculate the value of the current. So you get I as BE sine theta 2 by sine theta 3 times 2 pi R by mu naught when you rearrange and substitute the values that are given, that's BE, sine 27 by sine 125, times 2 pi times r, the radius is 12 centimeters, the radius in this case is the distance, so that's 0 0.12 meter divided by mu naught. And we get this current as 17 amperes, and we know that this current is into the page. See, that's what is shown by this cross. Remember, the current has to be into the page because by the right-hand rule, that's when the magnetic field would be down due to that current. So here you have two long parallel wires, 8.20 centimeter apart, carrying 16.5 ampere currents in the same direction. So two long parallel wires carrying currents in the same direction. Determine the magnetic field vector at a point P, 12 centimeter from one wire and 13 from the other. So, here are the two wires. So, those are the two wires kept parallel. It's shown into the screen and they are separated by 8.20 centimeter. And we are trying to find the magnetic field at this point, which is 12 centimeter from this one and 13 from this one. So quite simple, apply the formula for magnetic field due to a straight conductor and calculate the individual magnetic fields. First B1 due to this one and B2 due to this one. So apply the formula. So we get B1. Likewise, we calculate B2. And once we get B1 and B2, we need to calculate the net magnetic field, right? For which you'll have to find those angles. Okay, so once again, we're using the law of cosines to find the angles as we did before. So theta 1 would be this angle. Theta 1 is this angle. And as you can see, 
And theta 2 is this angle. This is theta 2. And when, when I con continue, you will see why I had to find those two angles. Basically because I had to resolve the magnetic field into X and Y. So when you look at the magnetic fields, you're going to get B1 and B2. Let me show you the diagram here and show the whole thing. So B1 is perpendicular to the plane containing these two. B2 likewise should be perpendicular to the plane containing the conductor and that point. So that's B2. So see B2 is perpendicular to this and B1 is perpendicular to this. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the net magnetic field. In order to find that, you got to break B1 into the vertical component and the horizontal. Likewise, B2 would be broken up into the vertical and the horizontal. See that the vertical components are opposite to each other. Right? The vertical components are opposite to each other there. So that's how that's why by and bx are opposite to and when you look at a bx remember both of them are along the negative direction that's why you have negative b1 sine theta 1 negative b2 sine theta 2 in effect, you're adding them, but since both are along the negative, you're getting a negative sum, okay? That's what is done here. So that's why we needed those angles. See the sine 77.6, and here it's sine 64.4. So you get the total Bx, you get the total By, and you can find the net, like we did before. And then you can also find the angle using tan inverse by by bx. I've moved fast through this because there was one exactly similar to this that was discussed before. So I, I hope you got it. So here a toroid has a 50 centimeter inner diameter and 54 centimeter outer diameter. It carries a 25 ampere current in its 687 coils. Determine the range of values for B inside the solenoid. You remember that uh, the toroid has an inner radius and an outer radius. And therefore, at the tip of the innermost inner radius, it'll have a certain magnetic field. And then at the outer, it'll have much smaller magnetic field, right? So that's why it has a range. All we got to do is just apply the formula for magnetic field due to a toroid which is mu naught caps Ni by 2 pi r. So when the radius is maximum, that means for the outer radius, you're going to get minimum magnetic field, which is what I've calculated now. First, so you have the number of turns, you have the current given, and the outer radius is half of 54, which is 27, it's 0.27 meter. In the same way, we can find the maximum magnetic field by simply substituting the inner radius. Because when the radius is minimum, the magnetic field is maximum. So that's why we have 2 pi times 0.25, because it's 25 centimeters. And then the range of values must be between these two, which is written in this way. So B lies between 13.7, that, that's milli tesla, because it's 10 to the negative 3, and this is 12.7 milli tesla. So here is a question which is connected to a solenoid, a 20 meter long copper wire, 2 millimeter in diameter including insulation, is tightly wrapped in a single layer with adjacent coils touching to form a solenoid of outer diameter 
2.50 centimeter. Let's not understand the meaning of that first. So after you wind it, the outer diameter is given as 2.50. But remember that the cable used has a diameter of 2 millimeter. So if you take caps D and little d as the di outer and inner diameters, so the outer diameter is 2.50 centimeter. And since the cable has little d, you're going to get the average diameter as I'm going to show you. So you have the outer diameter is caps D, the inner diameter, which is the thickness or diameter of this uh, wire as little d. So the average is going to be d minus d. All right, the average is going to be d minus d as I have shown here, okay? So it's d minus d. You don't take the average like you normally do. Please don't think about adding two numbers and dividing by two. According to this, and if you look at the diagram, you will understand that the average is from this point to this point. That's the average, which is clearly as shown d minus d. So once you get the average diameter, we can find the length of the solenoid. Because we know that one turn has a circumference which is given by pi times the average diameter. Pi times the average diameter. So you see that? Pi times the average diameter is the circumference of one turn. And so Totally, you know the length. So if you divide the length by that circumference, you should be able to get the number of loops. Now think about it. So the number of loops is here, the total length divided by the circumference, and therefore the length of the solenoid. Because we got the number of loops, the length of the solenoid should be the number of loops multiplied by the width of one turn. Width of one turn would be the diameter of that wire. So that's why I multiplied it with little d. There's a little logic here which you have to try to understand. So once you get that formula, little d is two millimeters in meter. That's two times 10 to the negative three. You have 20 meters as the length pi times. Both of these are in meters. So that's why you have those numbers. We get the length of the solenoid as 0.554 meter. The second part says find the field at the center when the current in the wire is 16.7 ampere. Now for a solenoid we know that the magnetic field is given by B is equal to mu naught n i by n i. Actually B is equal to mu naught little n i where little n is the number of turns in one meter. In this case, the number of turns in one meter is going to be one by d. Yeah, because it's one meter divided by d. For example, here each one is two millimeters, correct? Each turn is two millimeters. And in a meter you have a thousand millimeters. So thousand divided by two, there should be 500 turns. Okay, which is 1 divided by d. All right, therefore, in place of n, little n, we put 1 by d, okay? Because little n is the number of turns in 1 meter. And so, you get 10.5 times 10 to the negative 3 Tesla. A circular conducting ring of radius caps R is connected to two exterior straight wires at two ends of a diameter. The current I splits into unequal portions as shown while passing through the ring. What is B at the center of the ring? So here's the diagram. So you have a circular conducting ring right there. The current is coming in, it splits into two. One part goes over the top. The second part flows through the bottom and then they, they combine here we are asked to find the magnetic field at the center. 
So we have to use the right hand rule and determine the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, the currents are given in the diagram as 0.65i and 0.35i. So that's, that's given in the diagram. So here is the a magnetic field. This is not a loop. So first of all, understand that the field from the top, so the field due to the current here would be into the page because of the right hand rule and the field due to the current in the bottom would be out of the page. So when you use your right hand rule, you can understand that. See, because you have to hold the thumb on the top part. The thumb shows the direction of the current, which is flowing up. And so when you come into the middle, you see the fingers bend that way. So that will be into the page, see, into the page. Likewise, the current here at the bottom is flowing this way. So the center is here. And now it's out of the page. See that? It's out of the page. So we know that they are in opposite directions. So when we try to find the net magnetic field, we're going to subtract. But first, let's find the, the magnetic field due to each one. The magnetic field is given by this formula. Mu naught i by 4 pi integral ds by r squared where ds is the length of that part. The length of each part is half the circumference, right? So we can take out the r squared and then we know that ds is pi r. So that's why you see the pi r there, which is common. And I've taken that common factor out because you're going to get the same thing here. And then the only difference is I1 and I2. So that's taken together here as I1 minus I2. And the pi's cancel out and you get mu naught by 4R 0 0.65I because I1 is 0 0.65I, I2 is 0.35I. And finally, we get 3 by 4, 40, mu naught I by R. It's into the page because the magnetic field due to the top current is bigger. So, and therefore, the resultant is into the page. So this is a, one of the tougher chapters because there is 3D here, and there's a lot of formulas, and I hope you take time to understand the, the theory and how the problems have been worked out. So good luck, and see you on the next video. Cut.